Well, let's go ahead and get started this afternoon uh, for our session and welcome to this part of our Renewable Energy and Energy Effic Efficiency Technology Expo and Policy Forum. And we will be holding uh, sessions for the rest of the afternoon until a little after 4 o'clock. You'll have the chance to hear from a number of speakers and providing a really good overview of what is happening in their technologies. And obviously, this is all very complementary to what you are seeing in the caucus room and through all of the exhibits. So we're just glad that you're here. And I'm sure that there will be people uh, more and more people coming as we go through this session. But in this particular session, we're going to be taking a look at fuel cells, geothermal, solar, and energy from waste. And any of these folks could talk for hours with regard to their technologies, the opportunities, what's underway, the kinds of projects that have been deployed in the U.S. and around the world. Uh, so they only have a very short period of time, so we want to get our panel underway. And we will first hear from Carl Gaywell, who is the Executive Director of the Geothermal Energy Association. Geothermal, terribly important resource that is very abundant in the U.S and I think oftentimes is ignored, um, or it certainly doesn't get nearly the attention that it should. Uh, very, very important with regard to baseload and all sorts of other applications. Carl? Thank you, Carol. We could talk for hours, but you know the old question is, would we say anything? Uh, I'll try to keep this short and sweet, give you a glimpse of what's going on with geothermal today and what some of the issues we face are, and we'll go from there. Uh, first of all, the geothermal market in the U.S. is still growing. I mean, despite the lackluster economic growth up to, I guess, up to the recent quarter, uh, there hasn't been a lot of demand growth. But we put on a, just short of 100 megawatts last year, which with a 3,000 megawatt base is, is reasonably good growth in the U.S. But there's still a large resource that's untapped. They estimate there's 10,000 uh, sites, 10,000 megawatts worth of sites identified. The USGS estimates up to an additional 73,000 of undiscovered resource still to go. And that's just conventional type of resource. Then you get to advanced resources and EGS, and you've got a large resource base that really we're at the front end of, which is, I think, one of the things people don't understand about geothermal energy. They don't understand it's still really a young technology like others are. We're still learning how to use it. We're still barely entering the resource base. And both surface technology and subsurface technology has a lot of advances, a lot of ways to go. But what hurts us, even moving down that road, is inconsistent policies. I think we could all talk about the federal tax code. I mean, it just even amongst the renewables, it picks and chooses winners. When, I don't think that's its intent, but that's what it's doing right now. We need, we need some stability and some continuity there so that people get fair treatment and long-term treatment. I know the biomass folks have the same problem, that it often doesn't really work the way it's structured for them at all, even though it's intended to. So federal policy, it's always what people want to talk about taxes. I'll add to that, though, a new one. Yesterday's hearing, uh, the Department of Energy released uh, for Chairman Lamborn a little study that shows how long it takes you to get a project approved. And what this shows is that the NEPA requirements for a geothermal plant are about three times greater or more than it is for a solar plant or an oil and gas project. So we're looking at a project where, they're, according to the Department of Energy, five to seven years worth of NEPA analysis. I mean, that simply makes projects uneconomic. So one of the things we face is sort of stifling bureaucracy. More than half of our projects are in federal public land. And unless the issue of process is addressed, and no one wants to cut out proper environmental review, but I spoke with one senior official from the Senate the other day who said to me, you know, well, there's got to be some administrative ways to deal with this. And I said, if there, if there aren't, you're going to see very few projects built because the time frames just don't work. So federal level, it's taxes. And then because we're a public land resource, public land is a big problem that we face there. And then at the state level, you end up with inconsistent policies as well. As states figure out how to move forward with integration of large amounts of renewables. They will see large amounts of renewables. We're going to put a lot more solar and wind online. And the one thing you don't really realize back here is how much is available and being bid in the West in these, these systems. We can go a long way with renewables. The question is finding the right integration and how to have a market mechanism that puts together transportation integration for whole systems costs, which gives you strong renewable performance at the least total cost to the consumer. And that's still something the states are struggling with to do properly. But until they do, until they understand how to value geothermal, because geothermal is not just a baseload resource, geothermal plants can be engineered to ramp up and down. So they can meet firming needs as well. 
but you've got to have policies which price that properly for people to want to build power plants to meet those needs, and we don't have those in place yet. So both at the federal level and the state level, we have inconsistent policies or gaps in policies which create real problems. But the, globe, the world the U.S. market continues to grow, and some days I think almost in spite of the governments. Uh, we still continue to build new power plants. I think some of our companies deserve sort of medals for getting them done these some days. But globally, the market's even stronger. Globally, we're seeing 80 countries moving forward with about 800 projects right now. And U.S. companies, because of their expertise, are very busy around the world. I find that my board members are often very difficult to contact because they often are outside the United States these days. But that's good news. At least they're doing business. We're seeing a booming market worldwide because most of the systems worldwide are conventional power systems. They're hydrothermal systems, which we have probably the strongest expertise in the world in terms of developing. And you can see what happens where technology fits in. If you go by our booth, you can ask for a copy of GEO 101. There's a little chart, which we don't have PowerPoints, but I can show you of how the growth in the market has occurred. One of the things which you'll notice is that the growth in the, the geothermal market in the U.S. has followed technology. First, we developed flash plants, we developed the dry steam plants, the geysers, I'm sorry, then flash plants, and then binary plants. Today, binary power plants are more than 90% of the projects we are installing in, our, in the United States. And by binary, they can give you a quick demonstration, but it's a dual, dual fluid plant that uses the heat in the geothermal fluid to turn a working fluid, but neither the geothermal fluid nor the working fluid are ever exposed to the environment. They're never released, there's no emissions, they're very low profile, low emissions plants. Those plants are not being built around the world, so we're still at the front end of what we can do with that technology. And then lately, we've seen not just new technologies moving forward, but we've seen pretty new commitments by the Department of Energy. DOE has just announced a new initiative for subsurface technology development called the FORGE, or the Frontier Observatory for Research in Geothermal Energy. It wants to establish so that we can understand how to work the subsurface effectively to produce, according to DOE, as much as 100 gigawatts of geothermal energy in the United States. So the one thing about geothermal, if I had to ask people to walk away with, is understand that there's a lot of new things happening and will continue to happen, both at the surface in terms of technology of plants using lower fluid, lower temperature fuel fluids, seeing smaller power plants being used for almost for essentially distributed generation, looking at projects that are coupling with oil and gas wells to produce power from the hot water that comes up from thousands of oil and gas wells. So you're seeing a lot of surface technology developments and you're seeing subsurface technology developments. And I'm, one of the things we'll be doing next week will be in Reno at our annual geothermal summit, which really focuses on the western state aspects. But there we'll also be giving out awards, awards for environmental stewardship, which we'll be giving to the Salton Sea Restoration Initiative, which looks at looking at developing the geothermal resources in the Salton Sea as it faces a water crisis to create environmental benefits to the whole region. Um, it's a really interesting plan, one which has supported groups like Defenders of Wildlife and the Sierra Club as well. But we're also giving technology leadership awards to several companies who develop new drilling techniques, new hybrid power plants, and new lower temperature power plants, and all just in the last year. So despite the fact it's a sort of a slack market, technology moves forward, the companies are moving forward, we could move to go forward a lot faster if we would have consistent, long-term federal and state policies that promoted renewables instead of the dribs and drabs we get, and if we could cut the bureaucracy to what's really needed and not what seems to get dished out. Um, these are major factors that impede geothermal. They're all things that can be addressed. The resource is huge. We're just still learning how to use it. The technology we're developing to help us use it more in many, many more wider areas. And I think the U.S. maintains world leadership today, but I don't know whether that will last for long. The world market is growing much faster than ours. You're seeing a lot of interest in Europe. I mean, Germany, Switzerland. I mean, Switzerland spoke at our conference in March, and they said, if there's one country that has no geothermal resources, it's us, but we're trying to develop them. Because they're trying to develop the technology that could be used almost anywhere, the type of technology DOE's looking in the long run here. And we're seeing a lot of advancements around the world, a lot of commitment to it. If the U.S. continues its commitments and expands them so that we get policies that support industry and support technology development, Geothermal could be a major player in the U.S. markets in the future. So thank you. Great. Thank you very, very much, Carl. And as Carl said, that there's a lot of information available at the geothermal booth. Really, really want to encourage you to stop by there to learn more, as, as well as the booths of our other speakers. So we're now going to turn to Bud DeFlavis, who is the Director of Government Affairs with the Fuel Cell and Hydrogen Energy Association, to get an update in terms of the overall status. This is another growing 
um, uh, industry in terms of both looking at how it's evolving and also its fast deployment. Thanks, Carol. Uh, um, the Fuel Cell Hydrogen Energy Association is a trade association made up of, uh, uh, we're obviously interested in fuel cells and hydrogen, and, and the, the technologies are being developed and deployed for, uh, I'm going to speak broadly here, for stationary applications as well as automotive applications. Our members are some of uh, some household names, some, things, some companies and organizations you may have heard of, and it ranges a very diverse group. It ranges from General Motors, Honda, Toyota, the automakers, some stationary developers, including Bloom Energy, Fuel Cell Energy, LG, um, also some industrial gas companies, Air Products, Lindy. These are all folks who have some kind of interest in developing and deploying these technologies. So I wanted to give a little bit of an update on, on where things stand. And I'll first, uh, uh, first discuss the vehicle market. Um, some people may remember back in 2003, uh, President Bush kind of set, off, set us on this course of developing hydrogen fuel cells for vehicles. Fuel cell vehicles, first of all, are electric vehicles, and they, 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 um, they are slightly different than a battery electric vehicle, but they use hydrogen on board the vehicle to essentially generate electricity. Um, the, the goal then was to, again, this is 2003, was to develop the technology where a child born today, this is, I'm kind of paraphrasing from his speech, a child born today can drive one of these zero polluting vehicles um, by the time he or she is ready to, to, uh, to drive. Uh, we're a little bit ahead of the curve, actually, and that's, I think, due in part to the Department of Energy program, as well as the persistence and the, um, the investments that the private sector has made. So government working in collaboration with, with uh, private industry. Um, the first vehicles are actually have gone on sale. They've been tested extensively in places like California, a few other areas where there's been a commitment to hydrogen infrastructure. But uh, last month, uh, Hyundai actually started leasing vehicles. Toyota's made an announcement as far as uh, when they're going to be introducing vehicles here in the United States. Uh, Honda's very close behind, is, is not very far behind. So we're seeing, uh, and then other companies as well are equally uh, invested and probably uh, have somewhat s slightly different but equally aggressive timelines. Fuel cell vehicles are interesting because, as I mentioned, they are battery vehicles, but um, there are some inherent advantages uh, with the, the ranges are uh, generally a lot better than, say, a traditional battery electric vehicle. The recharging time, if you want to call it that, really the fill time, is along the line of a conventional vehicle, three to five minutes. So you have a lot of the consumer, uh, some of the uh, things we're used to driving, the, the advantages of vehicles that we're used to having today um, that, are, um, that are inherent in these vehicles. Now, uh, infrastructure is going to be an issue, and, uh, but uh, there, there are a few areas uh, that I can touch upon briefly in that. Um, California has really spent a lot of time, money, and effort to try and um, figure out where to put hydrogen infrastructure, where to put it smartly, how to in, how the investments, how to engage the um, the private sector as far as um, 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 financing some of these some of these new stations, and that's uh, going quite well. The California Fuel Cell Partnership did a lot of that early that work that early work about five, ten years ago. We're seeing uh, a na nationwide uh, pr um, um, program called H2USA, which is kind of taking that next step and going beyond California. Obviously, the automakers want to sell cars outside of California, and um, so there's a next, the next step, which is H2USA. There's also an eight-state MOU, which kind of looks at um, um, there have been eight states that have kind of joined in this m memorandum of understanding how to uh, put I think it's uh, about three million vehicles on the road by a certain time, I think 2020, and fuel cells are obviously included in that, in that, uh, in that mix. Uh, I mentioned that fuel cells are also being developed for uh, stationary markets for you know, power generation, uh, either straight power generation, combined heat and power, or in combination with utilities. Um, we have a number of companies that are, are, have done uh, quite well and, and are growing, and um, one company, Fuel Cell Energy, which is actually providing a bit of an export market for the stationary for the stationary market. Bloom Energy, some of you may have heard of them, they're out of California. Actually have a really neat story. They, um, they're manufacturing primarily in California, but they opened a second facility recently in Delaware. Actually an old Chrysler plant, which is kind of a nice story. Um, a lot of their products are at Fortune 500 companies using um, their, their technology, their power generation technology. <clears throat> primarily for uh, data centers or for operations. Uh, Apple has a large 
uh, fuel cell uh, facility in uh, at their uh, at their at their uh, data center in North Carolina, um, and other Fortune 500 companies. There's also material handling equipment. Fuel cells are being kind of swapped out for battery um, forklifts as well in some industrial facilities. Walmart just recently purchased a lot of fuel cells for uh, for some of their material handling equipment. Uh, some other notable things, um, LG, which is a Korean company, has a kind of a large research and development and, and which will be ramped up to a uh, manufacturing facility in Ohio very soon. And uh, General Electric is kind of getting back into the stationary fuel cell market. So some very interesting things there. Uh, and I'm happy to kind of um, you know, expound later if, 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 the, if time per permits. Uh, legislatively, um, you know, I think I want to kind of echo some of the, you know, getting away from this technology du jour, you know, steady kind of focused um, um, uh, funding for, you know, research and development projects or um, deployment projects, advanced deployment projects is probably a very good thing. Um, we've, again, we've seen a lot of private dollars go into this. But um, a steady kind of continued commitment from the government is, is very important. Tax credits, particularly this year, there's two sets of tax credits. And um, again, I'll speak in generalities here. But the investment tax credit for some of these stationary fuel cell units is, um, is particularly important. Those are expiring at the end of 2016. Um, I did mention fuel cell vehicles are kind of coming online this year. Uh, unfortunately, those credits that we enjoy for the fuel cell vehicles are not matched up with the Basically, the fuel cell vehicle credits and the hydrogen credits are expiring this year, just as the fuel cell vehicles are coming into market. So we're stuck in a situation where, should these expire, there will be plenty of tax credits for plug-in battery electric vehicles, but fuel cell electric vehicles may be left behind. And that would be a real kind of, that would be a situation where we kind of, not on purpose, just because of deadlines and and an oversight, you know, and proper, proper oversight, that we uh, are incenting one electric vehicle platform over another, and that obviously would be problematic. And um, with that, I'll I think I'm pretty close to my time. So great, thanks, thanks, Carol. Thanks so much. So now we're going to turn to commercial and utility scale solar projects. And to learn a little bit more about that, we're going to hear from Dave Bremi, who is the Vice President for Federal Markets with the M&W Group. Good afternoon. Thanks for coming. And um, thanks for hosting us here. It's a, a great event every year. Um, so I, let me just give you a little background. So I work with the uh, M&W Group and their Gerlicher Solar America Group, which is a uh, a wholly owned subsidiary. Uh, M&W builds uh, high-tech uh, construction facilities and manufacturing facilities for companies like Intel, Applied Materials, so very involved uh, manufacturing facilities. They also build um, manufacturing facilities for the solar industry, have built like two and a half gigawatts of solar manufacturing capacity. Um, our company works downstream actually building solar power plants that we put in the ground. So we're an EPC company, meaning enter, um, engineering, procurement, construction. We work with developers and finance companies that develop these projects, finance them, and then we come in and uh, build them and then do the long-term operations and maintenance. So we do the fun part of it um, for the most part. Um, I've been in the industry 14 years and, and could talk for hours and hours about what's gone on. The industry, like a lot of young industries, like the semiconductor industry, has gone like this up and down, boom and bust, mostly related to subsidy programs in different countries that you've probably heard about, including uh, incentives and subsidies here in the U.S. At the moment, the solar industry is finally on its feet and is, get, is on a, a just starting on a what we think is a sustained ramp um, uh, going forward uh, as a result of more than an 80 percent drop in the install cost of solar over the last five years. Um, so that, uh, what that's allowed us to be at grid parity at retail costs. So a lot of the states where you have high cost of energy like New York uh, in New England and people are paying 14, 15 cents a kilowatt hour at their house, solar um, with very little subsidies uh, is at the same price. Um, we're approaching next year where will be no subsidies be required in higher cost utility markets for residential solar. Um, when you look at the wholesale cost of solar in various parts of the country, we're getting close to grid parity in the next three to four years. DOE just published a, a, just a fabulous chart that shows the decline, uh, declining price of solar 
compared to uh, where utility cost is right now and where it's expected to go. So uh, they originally had uh, uh, put out this chart about 15 years ago that showed grid parity happening in, in 2020 to 25, and here we are in 2014-15 at grid parity. So it's pretty exciting. Um, right now in the U.S., there's approximately 150,000 jobs directly related to the solar industry. Um, I think there's roughly 6,500 companies across the U.S., um, pretty broadly um, distributed across the U.S., actually, when you look at a map of it. Um, Last year, the industry installed about five and a half gigawatts of solar in the U.S. alone. This year, uh, we'll easily do eight gigawatts of solar. The majority of that is uh, in distributed generation, not in large-scale base load. You know, these giant solar farms you see out that are hundreds of megawatts. Um, that part of the marketplace where you have what we call utility scale and those size of, of systems are will be less and less, and you'll see more and more five, ten megawatt systems, one megawatt, hundreds of kilowatts, so distributed generation. Um, the, what's interesting about distributed generation right now is, is that um, we're at a place where the solar industry is still less than one percent of the overall energy mix in this country, and yet we have the utilities fighting back tooth and nail, trying to reduce our uh, access to the grid now because they can see that when you take the new model of solar, and deploy it with battery storage, uh, fuel cell backup storage, a lot of the people that are here with different types of uh, storage technologies, all of a sudden you have a very compelling story uh, to not only do peak shaving, but to actually have a product that can, that can release energy at any time, even at night. So my company right now, we're building our first two large battery storage systems, one in New Jersey and one in California. Um, it makes, it, it's game changing right now. The price of batteries have come down and the engineering around it has gone up. Um, so at, at this point, we are, we're seeing now that the, the, the utilities are looking at their models that they've done forever centralized distribution, making money off transmission and distribution, and they're seeing all of these electron sales they're not making, and seeing the solar industry using the grid um, as a way to make inroads. Um, and th this leads me to my point about what's, what's really needed from Capitol Hill is guidance on what is coming down the pike, and that is distributed generation, and how to change our, what is otherwise a centralized distribution system of energy into regional uh, local, where many, many regional distributed inputs from solar, geothermal, wind, et cetera, can go into the grid and be managed appropriately without having grid stability problems. They're already doing that in Germany. They're figuring that out. Um, the technology exists. It, and we merely need the political and the economic will right now. Um, in New York State has just passed legislation. They're way out of the head of the curve, already making the utilities in New, in New York State start to look at how to set up their grids to accept all these inputs, have regional local microgrids that have a lot of inputs that then feed into a, a wider area. Um, uh, by far, that's the biggest, I think, the biggest challenge for our industry and for the renewables industry is how to have this kind of grid um, that is accepting distributed inputs. The other pieces for solar is the, um, is the need for financial innovation where uh, uh, legislated uh, capabilities that people have for in other industries to be able to use REITs or to be able to use things like master limited partnerships that the fossil fuel industry gets to use, um, which helps reduce the cost of money and investment in these projects. These are the things that need to be supported um, you know, here on Capitol Hill as a way to make renewables um, play in a much more level playing field. I think that the biggest issue uh, beyond, beyond the things I've just mentioned is just the, the, the issue around general subsidies, embedded subsidies, already amortized subsidies that other forms of mostly fossil fuel energies is the benefit of right now. We've dropped our price almost 100 percent, I mean, crazy price drops, and we've done that with a tenth of the subsidies that uh, the other industries that we compete with get. So I think I'll stop right there and, and leave it at that. Great. Thank you so much. And if we have any time left at the end, we'll, we'll um, try and take a few questions then. So we are now going to turn to LaToya Glenn. 
uh, who is the Renewable Energy Business Manager with Waste Management. She and our next speaker, following speaker, will are going to talk about another whole area um, that involves all of the waste that we have that have a huge amount of energy embedded in them that it is a shame if we don't make use of it. Latoya? Hi, once again, I am a Renewable Energy Manager with Waste Management. Waste Management is North America's leading environmental solutions provider. We serve well over 21 million customers a week. Not only are we in the North America, we're also in Canada as well, so we do business there. We are determined to work with our customers, educate our customers on what we do, how we do it, and how it best serve the environment. We partner with customers such as the University of New Hampshire, Ford, GM, communities, local organizations, you name it, we are willing to do business. We have the natural gas there to assist with that. Many people across the country do not realize that waste management is actually a leading provider for renewable energy. We develop, we operate, we own our own landfill gas to energy facilities. We have 137 facilities throughout the U.S. It's beneficial projects that we utilize at certain landfill sites that we have. A way that we produce this electricity via renewable energy um, service, I guess you would normally call it, is that we take our waste. So once we collect our waste and transport it to our landfills throughout the U.S., that waste is anaerobically decomposes. It's a natural methane gas. It's a natural gas. We take that natural gas component and we use piping wells via or the lining of our landfills and we transport it to our generating facilities. So when I mentioned the 100, 137 landfill gas generating facilities that we have, we build that actual facility at particular sites. Once we have the methane gas, we harness, in, we harness the energy value from that landfill gas and we sell it on site. Well, we utilize it on site, we also sell it to our customers, to the grid as well. We assist customers with their sustainability goals. You may have universities, you may have an organization that's greening up per se, and they need to be educated, they want to utilize our commodity that's a natural product to assist them with their sustainable goals. Not only is this process a natural thing, it also helps with reducing emissions. And it also serves as a, we serve as an energy supplier for our country. It's, it's a natural product. It's, it's an easy mechanism to use. It's there, so why not use it in the best way for the environment? Not only do we sell electricity from this methane gas in which we generate through our facilities, this methane gas can also be converted as a natural gas product, such as, um, you could say, compressed natural gas. We use it, utilize it as liquefied natural gas to green our trucks as well. So we have 32,000 collection trucks that we utilize. Out of that 32,000 collection trucks, 10%, which is 3,200 landfill gas trucks that you see driving around to collect the waste, we utilize that as fuel. Not only do we utilize it as fuel for our use, we actually have about 60 fueling stations that we're putting out through the U.S. to utilize for public and for our own operating use as, as fuel. With the entire process that we have, the customer base that we have, the focus, the education that we're able to provide to our customers, and the commodity that's there, we honestly would love for Congress to pass a comprehensive energy policy, as well as embracing the natural gas, since we've been a leader in natural gas since about 1990. Waste management has been around for quite some time now. We are a leading provider of what we offer, electricity, fuel, and we're looking forward to new technologies. We're looking forward to partner with companies that are able to bring about the technology to utilize this landfill gas. That's there for the best, for the environment as well as North America and international business to come. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Latoya. And we'll now turn to David Bitterman, who is the Vice President for Advocacy with the National Waste and Recycling Association. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, 
So I'm with the National Waste and Recycling Association. Quick show of hands before today. How many of you had heard of us? Raise your hands. Very few. I'm not surprised to see that. And the reason for that is because we changed our name last year. So we used to be something called the Environmental Industry Associations, but nobody knew what that meant. And EIA is an acronym that the folks at the Department of Energy use for something else, so that was confusing. So we're the National Waste and Recycling Association. But the reason we made that name change relates to why we're here today. You know, the, the waste industry, um, as she mentioned, has, is changing. We're not all about just picking up garbage and putting it somewhere. We're about extracting as much value as we can from it. We're about as recycling as much as we can from it. And we're about educating our customers how to generate less of it. Um, the energy value from waste is, is extraordinary. And that's something that we're very focused on at our association. Uh, so we're a national trade organization. We have uh, more than 800 members that operate <clears throat> in all 50 states. So uh, every member of Congress has a member of our association in their district. And we work closely with Congress and several of the federal agencies, particularly EPA, um, to inform them and educate them about policy uh, that they either should or shouldn't be making. So um, I'm going to take a brief amount of time to uh, talk some trash here and um, hopefully educate some of you about what our industry does. Uh, waste management, of course, is our largest member, and they have a great story to tell. Um, but the story is even broader than that. So every person in the United States generates about four pounds of garbage every day. You generate it in your house, you generate it in your office. Um, if you take everybody in the United States, that's 250 million tons of garbage a year. It's a lot of trash. So where does it go? Um, it goes to landfills, it goes to some, about a third of it gets recycled. Uh, the good news is that per capita, the amount of waste generated in the United States is actually declining. It's been declining for the past 12, 13 years. And the reasons for that are changes in consumption patterns, the economic uh, decline um, following the Great Recession. Um, just think about how many newspapers you don't read that you used to read. Now everybody gets news on the internet. The amount of paper generated in the United States has declined very significantly. Um, the other thing to keep in mind about the waste industry is that um, we're a very reliable, low-cost service. The amount that people pay to have their garbage picked up on a monthly basis um, compared to what you pay for your cell phone, for your internet, um, compared to um, cable television, it's, it's much smaller. And the service is, is, is incredible. Three times a week, usually, somebody brings a truck to your house to take away what you want to get rid of. You can't get a FedEx box picked up one time. I hope nobody from FedEx is in the room. Uh, but you can't do that one time for the cost that monthly garbage service is. So I mentioned that the, tra the waste and recyclables go to a variety of different places. Um, the majority of waste in the United States is still disposed of at landfills. Um, the good news is that there's no landfill crisis in the United States. That we're not, we don't have a shortage of capacity. Uh, the industry is providing a, a sufficient capacity throughout the United States. But we have peaked in terms of how much waste is going to landfills. That happened 20 plus years ago, back in 1990. And that's because we're seeing increased recycling. We're seeing increased in waste diversion. And as I'll mention in a moment, we're seeing a, a renewed interest in food waste recycling and capturing the organic portion of the waste stream. Um, just to touch on recycling for a moment. Um, according to EPA in 2012, we recycled 65 million tons of paper, cans, and bottles, and composted another 21 million tons of yard waste. Um, this is an essential part of what we do. Recycling allows us, as Americans, to conserve vital natural resources, reduce pollution, and conserve energy. It's, it's really important. It's a growing portion of our business model. It's a growing portion of the waste stream. Um, it's over a third of the waste now generated in the United States, and that number is just increasing. So in addition to recycling the traditional paper, glass, and, and bottles, we, there's also growing interest in food waste and composting. Composting is a process that turns organic material into nutrient fuel, nutrient rich soil that can be used by industries and, um, in, and to um, supplement uh, farmland. There's about 3,000 yard waste composting facilities now in the United States. But what we're seeing um, as uh, companies that are innovating is creating something called anaerobic digestion. These are food waste only facilities that are starting to pop up, particularly in the northeastern United States, as states pass laws mandating that food waste be diverted. Um, this is a very exciting thing that's happening as we continue to uh, generate energy from a larger portion of the waste stream. 
and um, our industry is helping to lead the way in making that happen. Now, when you think about renewable energy, I'm sure you think about wind and you think about solar and you think about hydro. Not a lot of people think about the waste industry. But the waste industry is as significant, if not larger, than those important portions of the renewable fuel to, uh, area um, in the United States. So currently, according to EPA, there are 636 landfills in the United States that generate landfill gas where that gas is then used either on site or piped to an industrial user or into the grid. Um, that is something on the order of 2,000 megawatts annually generated per year. And there's another 450 candidates um, that the EPA has identified that could also participate in these programs. Um, just by point of comparison, there's less than 2,000 operating landfills in the United States. So to have more than 600 landfills participating um, in generating renewable fuel uh, to decrease our dependence on foreign oil, I think is a very significant uh, success story. Because of the increased use of landfill gas, uh, landfill emissions um, have decreased by 30 percent since 1990 as a result of these landfill gas projects. That's a very significant contributor to reducing the impact of the industry on climate change because methane, as I think many of you know, has adverse effects um, on the environment um, on, 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 and is an adverse climate change. Um, landfill gas projects uh, generate renewable fuel. They offset the use of non-renewable resources. They help produce jobs in the community. And landfill gas is used by companies like Honeywell, S.E. Johnson, BMW, Dell, NASA is using it, University of New Hampshire is using it. And just last week, um, one of our member companies in upstate New York, Progressive Waste, announced that they had opened up a, they had expanded their existing landfill gas project, and they're going to start be, they're going to start shipping some of the gas from New York to California to, because they've sold it to companies in California that want to take advantage of the fact that it's a renewable fuel. And they're also, as a byproduct of that, going to be pro uh, providing free energy to the local school districts. So that's the landfill gas portion of the, of the industry. There's also what are known as um, energy from waste facilities. Um, there's 84 of these in the United States. They generate uh, several thousand megawatts of energy also. And so between the landfill gas projects and these energy from waste projects, we're a significant contributor to um, renewable fuel in the United States. But that's not the only place we're innovating in the energy space. Um, garbage trucks, there's 130,000 garbage trucks in the United States. More than half of the garbage trucks sold in the United States last year, placed into service, use natural gas. We're an industry leader in the trucking sector for, for natural gas. And we're siting facilities. Um, when I say we, I don't mean our association, but our members. Um, and just here locally, Clean Energy is opening a, the first um, commercially available facility in Northern Virginia is opening it near Dulles Airport on August 13th. Just an example of what we're doing to help promote uh, the important use of this resource. So um, what do we need? As several of the people who spoke here on this panel and people on previous panels said earlier, we need business certainty when it comes to policy, when it comes to tax policy. Uh, many of the tax preferences that favor renewable fuels generally uh, expired in December. It is our hope that uh, in the lame duck session at the, after the election that these um, tax preferences are renewed either as part of comprehensive tax reform or as part of what's known as the extenders. It's really essential for business reasons for the investors in these projects to know uh, what the economics are going to be for them and having tax certainty is a critical component of, of those economics. Um, I'm sure I've used up almost all of my time, so I want to thank, uh, thank you for inviting us here today. We have a booth here. If people want to learn more about what we do, um, please feel free to stop by. We're right next to the ice cream. <laughs> there you go. It doesn't get better than that. Uh, and because you were all so efficient, we do have a few minutes for, uh, for your questions or comments. So if you have any, just wait till the microphone gets to you. Okay, and we've got a question right there, Emery. Yeah, I have a question to the representative from the M&W group. You talked about major advances in the combination of solar and batteries in terms of cost reduction, and I'd like to get some ideas to the magnitude of what you're talking about. Sure. So. Um, uh, 
traditional lead acid batteries pricing for the kind that they use for a, a solar system, which needs to be something called deep cycle, have already had about a 20% reduction in the last five years. Um, it's still got a long way to go, but it's allowing in certain marketplaces, um, in certain ISOs like the PJM, which has uh, uh, a number of issues with distributed inputs and general uh, stability of the grid. They like to have batteries that they can come into um, sitting at different points of the grid and, imme and have immediate, um, uh, immediate happiness, let's put it that way, in stabilizing the grid if they're having a frequency problem. Um, you know, that typically that's been, for, for the utility people in the audience, that's been uh, accomplished by having uh, spinning reserves of either a combined cycle plant or something that's standby all the time. But still, even though it's on reserve and it's spinning, it still takes about 10 to 15 minutes to come up. Batteries are instantaneous. So the utilities are starting to have their heads spun around, or, or not as much the utilities, but the ISOs who have, who have uh, uh, grid uh, reliability responsibility. Um, and, and are looking at batteries more and more, especially in places like the PJM that has these issues, um, ERCOT uh, down in Texas also. Um, the lithium ion battery world is another place that is for, um, for various uh, types of, of grid. So let me back up for a sec. So there's all these chemistries, everybody, and when you talk to battery people, they're like, I have the best chemistry, you know, we have the best, you know. But what it really comes down to is if chemistry is dependent on what you're trying to do. Is it frequency or grid stability? Is it demand response? Is it all these different things? So hopefully that answered. Does that help? Okay, okay other, okay. Uh, question here in the front first, and then we'll get you in the back. Um, my question is for Mr. DeFlavis, did I say that right? To flash? Okay. Um, so I was just wondering if the technology for um, recycling these fuel cells and kind of, you know, if they have whatever their lifespan is, yeah. if that technology has also been developing alongside um, improving fuel cell technology or kind of what the market is um, for. As far the, as the. Um, and just make sure your microphones are on. As far as the automotive, uh, I can't speak to that, but I know um, I was recently at the um, fuel cell energy plant in Connecticut, and their large, their fuel cells, the, these are large stationary fuel cells for power generation, combined heat and power. Those last about five years, and essentially what they do is after their uh, useful life, they kind of ship them back to, uh, they have a few, you know, contractors and what have you, and they, uh, they essentially take out all the, um, all the things that can't go into the melter and keep all the things that can, and essentially they just, um, they just um, uh, recycle, uh, I think it's like 99% of uh, the, the components that are involved in that, and then they just swap it out with a new one. So um, I think there, as far as, you know, so waste stream issues um, in general. Um, the automotive side, I can't speak to, but I'm, I know the, that uh, engineers have looked at that. But on the stationary side, it, they're doing it now. So um, as far as the actual power plants are concerned, uh, they're very, uh, all the components, uh, the, uh, the materials and what have you are, are very recyclable. But there's not a lot of, uh, there are, as far as I know, no nasty things that end up in, the, uh, in, the, in your landfills. So. <laughs> That's really good news. Okay, there was a question, a uh, couple questions in the back. Okay. Uh, hi, two things. <clears throat> for, for Dave from M&W, you had mentioned a California storage project. I was curious whether that is part of the uh, 1.3 uh, gigawatt California storage mandate. <laughs> And you know what is your experience, and if so, what is your experience of that process? And in addition, if anybody is familiar with uh, the progress at which um, uh, electric arc uh, plasma gasification of waste seems to be approaching a commercial reality. Um, so the project actually that we're building is not part of the, uh, the California program. Um, it's, uh, it's being added on to a, a 120 megawatt uh, utility scale that's being built right now. Um, and the local utility wanted uh, two megawatts for smoothing of that power coming out of there. Um, the, uh, the SGIP program that you're talking about, it's a small generation. Uh, uh, um, uh, that's, that's limited in size. Um, and I think one of the things they're going to find, I think it's capped at like 70 kilowatts, right? Something like that. 
Um, and it's uh, the problem with it is it's having a very hard time finding investors wanting to put all of that time and money into something so small. As far as you know, they could put that time and money into something with much bigger returns. But that program will happen because it's it's uh, companies like Solar City are aggregating together, you know, hundreds of homes with potentially that'll have batteries, um, and and uh, with that aggregation, then it becomes a much better uh, financial investment. And regarding your question about Plasma Arc, for seven eight years now, um, several companies have been announcing that they were they were about to start siting and operating the first big Plasma Arc facility in the United States, in particular somewhere in Florida. Um, it hasn't happened yet. It's difficult to scale that technology. Um, it's not necessarily ec not necessarily economically competitive with other sources of disposal. I still think it's at the laboratory stage, but it's one of the areas that people in the industry are looking at. Hi, this is another question for Dave from m and I'm from the Solar Electric Power Association, and m and is actually one of our members, so it's nice to meet you. Um, you mentioned that you're looking for some kind of federal action to clarify what the distributed generation landscape is going to look like. And I was wondering if you could elaborate more on what kind of action that might be. Great, thanks. Um, it, right now, uh, what we are experiencing is, is the, and then you, you, you know this from your group for sure, where the, uh, a lot of the utilities are pushing back and asking basically for people that have solar systems, whether it's residential in some states or large commercial and are accessing and are connected to the grid, that they pay a fee for using that grid. And, and that makes sense. I think that this is a, an evolving story of, is it, you know, $50 a month or is it, you know, pennies? Um, and the understanding of what those costs are, are I think, are yet to be um, un well understood. And I think that is part of what the, the uh, legislation needs to be, is how do you take a national grid that's overseen by a number of regional groups, and then you've got FERC up in, and NERC up here at the, up on the, up on the uh, uh, central level, um, and how do you make that into a market that can accept all these distributed inputs, that there, that there's a utility model that can, the utilities can exist on, ver transitioning from we're just selling electrons to now we're, we're actually managing these distributed resources and getting, uh, getting compensated for it in other ways other than just um, uh, selling electrons. So I think that really the, the near-term guidance is around how do we transition from where we are now to a fully functioning uh, inf grid infrastructure nationally that can handle all these inputs, microgrids, et cetera. And the near-term issue is, is on grid access for solar. If that, if that makes sense. Okay, we'll take one last question, I think, over here. Thanks. Uh, about regarding the fuel cell vehicles, aside from the uh, infrastructure problem and the hydrogen refueling stations, what, in terms of the outlook, uh, specific components of the value chain do you see like uh, becoming, being needed for, for further cost reductions uh, in terms of either the hydrogen side or the fuel cell stacks or? Yeah. Um, well, for, for the automotive market, I, I think um, some of the um, industrial gas folks uh, and people who are working on stations, they've already seen significant cost reductions. So um, I think you're going to, you know, we, we've kind of fallen into this classic chicken and egg problem. You know, no one's going to commit a lot of money to stations or station infrastructure until the vehicles start coming. But you're starting to see... Um, because of certain, you know, state incentives and government programs and things like that. And early, and frankly, some early, um, there's some companies who are investing quite a bit of money in some of these technologies. I think you're, you're going to start seeing a ramp up, and especially in states where um, there are either ZEV mandates or there's a commitment to um, um, uh, to have zero emission vehicles. As far as the, the vehicle side, and actually, so, and, and then obviously, um, where you get the hydrogen, obviously, it depends. It's somewhat regional, but, you know, this country, we're actually very fortunate to have quite a bit of natural gas that's coming online. There's also there's also some renewable sources, that, and the economics for those are kind of improving to the point where you can get either you know, natural gas for hydrogen or use some of these renewable methane sources for hydrogen. All those costs appear to be coming down. As far as the vehicles are concerned, um, you know, the, uh, the word we're getting from our major auto manufacturers are, um, you know, they've, uh, they've hit their durability targets, they've hit their manufacturing targets as far as, and once they start ramping up those production numbers, um, we'll, we'll be at a comparable to 
um, uh, to what vehicles we're used to driving now. Um, and you know, when you look at the efficiency of a fuel cell and compared to what the price of you know the average price of hydrogen will be, um, you're looking at a, a, as good, if not better, price for than gasoline right now. So, um, and again, um, so it just really depends on. Um, on ramping up uh, production of what we have now. So, um, again, I think, you know, the, the companies are looking at this understanding that if they don't hit or beat the, uh, the prices that we're paying for our transportation um, um, assets right now, you know, we're, we're kind of dead in the water, but, but uh, they're very confident that they're meeting those. And so um, there's a lot of different factors, but um, the, the progress has been really remarkable. Great. Thank you all. And I want to thank our panel. And I just encourage you to also try and check out these booths and everything. There weren't any questions with regard to geothermal. But don't forget how important that is also in terms of complementing this whole host of renewable energy technologies. Thanks a whole lot. Bye-bye.